Hi, and welcome to episode seven of The Focus. I'm Aldo Rol. And I'm Horia Slushansky. Welcome. So today we are uh, continuing the exploration of Adaptive Oversight Galaxy. If you share that with us, uh, uh, Horia, and we're going to look into that tension between exploring and innovating and maintaining a competent capability. Now, from the previous episodes, you've noticed that we do step systematically through the polarity map as a guide for us to explore both sides of that uh, tension of those tensions and what it is that we can do. Keep a uh, look at maintaining a nice equilibrium um, about that. But for this episode and the next two episodes, things are going to be slightly different. You've noticed that the galaxy uh, diagram has shown us uh, uh, the balances between competent capability and explore and innovate. But today we'll talk a little bit about the, um, the, today's episode and the next two episodes. Now, just stepping back is um, how did this polarity come about? And what we have been noticing when we were working or when we are working with customers, whether it be that as a scrum master or even as an actual person delivering software, we were in constant awareness that there is a tension um, in any organization about maintaining the current way of delivering value and then adapting to changing conditions. And we noticed all sorts of different behaviors around that. The first one is, is that organizations got into trouble if they change too fast. And let's put the people that were in charge of the uh, oversight function that gave them heart attacks and palpitations and sleepless nights. The other thing that also happened is, is that we noticed that organizations that change too slow um, made in dinosaurs. We only have to look at some of the big names, Nokia, uh, as, um, uh, 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 some of the uh, electronic uh, manufacturers uh, earlier on. Um, I forgot the name now, the, the fax machine company. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, more recently, think, for instance, of um, uh, Blueberry or Blackberry, or Blackberry. whatever the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> so changing too slow makes you a dinosaur, and that's as equally as risky as changing too fast. And this gives executives uh, uh, sleepless nights because they feel that they're being uh, ham hamstrung by not being able to keep up with the conditions, the changing conditions in the market. And then what we notice is that the organizations that got this right were the ones that was actually able to adjust in the pace of change in the organization dynamically. And that helped them to flourish. So there is this tension about change and not change. Um, and we call this specifically competent capability uh, comp uh, and explore and innovate and looking at what is the uh, the balance we need to have there. Oria. Yeah. Well, um, we ended up with naming the tension uh, like that because we essentially took three different perspectives. Uh, we said, what if um, from the perspective of the oversight function, the people doing the overseeing, uh, we look at this tension between keeping the lights going versus innovating, uh, what some people call ambidextry in modern organizations. So this preserve the status quo versus create a better work, a, a better way of work is what are the concerns of the oversight community when on the one hand, we need to deliver, 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 deliver. And on the other hand, it's our role as leaders, as people in the oversight community to, to inspire the creation of a better uh, way of work so that we can better uh, deliver in the future. Then um, a separate tension that expresses the same general characteristic 
Um, this, we looked at it from the perspective of the initiative, the team that is actually engaged in either a product or a service delivery or a project or a program or even some form of continuous flow initiative. So what do the people actually doing the work care about? Well, on the one hand, they will care about keeping things steady and deliver things well. And on the other hand, they may well need to invite some exploration. They may need to discover how to go about delivering things better as things change large and small around us. And finally, the third perspective um, that expresses the same underlying tendency between keeping things going as they are and uh, changing them is uh, expressed as follow the new rules versus change the rules. And this is seen from the perspective of the collaboration between the initiative and the oversight community. So if we think of this as some form of vertical layout and we have the oversight above and the initiative below, then uh, the preserve the status quo and create a better uh, way of work would be looking from up towards down. The keep it steady uh, and invite exploration would be looking from below upwards and the follow the new rules and change the rules is a combination of the two um, in terms of blending of the two perspectives together. Now, we originally designed these three as separate um, avenues of exploration and that's why this episode seven is gonna focus on preserve the status quo and create a better way of work. Episode eight is going to uh, focus on keep it steady and invite exploration. And episode nine is gonna focus on follow the new rules and change the rules. But all these three balances, despite the fact that we've explored them independently, they are captured in our galaxy graphic as a single balance to consider. The explore and innovate on the one hand and maintain competent capability on the other. So we have um, undertaken a simplification, if you will. We've combined all of those three into one in the overall picture. So um, Aldo, uh, would you like to take us through the struggle patterns of we call this preserve the status quo versus create a better uh, way of work. So what are the struggles of preserving the status quo, keeping th the lights going from the perspective of the oversight community? Thank you, Horia. So um, from the explanation uh, that Horia and I just done as an introduction to today's session, um, those you you'll notice that there may be something that repeat across all three of those patterns but we really try to keep it distinct uh in 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 these three different perspectives the first thing that um when we did the interviews uh with the panels from the people across the world um one thing that we noticed is that there were some really interesting human behaviors uh, when it comes to preserving the status quo. And one of the things, if you've never read that, of looking at the, um, the, the, the rules of bureaucracy, um, it, it's quite an interesting read if you wanna go through that, um, but it all comes back to this uh, human traits uh, related to power, secrecy, and fear. And remember that we're looking from the oversight community downwards, looking uh, down onto initiatives um, in order to oversee those initiatives. Um, we do, we have noticed from our own experience, also from the, the panelists that, that we talked to, that there's a lot of these types of shenanigans going on. Um, it's a fear-based uh, thing. It's driven mostly by fear. And we've noticed that when somebody fears something, when somebody fears any change, it, it manifests in really spectacular ways 
inside the organization, especially with powerful people. What we also noticed is that in some of the cases uh, and some of the comments is that there's this mindset of one size fits all. So for instance, um, we, uh, I worked with an organization here in New Zealand, a government organization, and they didn't make the distinction about when they initiate projects, whether the project would be run as a agile project which will then have a whole new set of rules or a traditional project. And there was space and, and uh, opportunity for both in that organization, but they try to apply the same mindset of governance onto both types of projects. They didn't adjust it. So this one size fits all mindset comes to mind. Um, the other thing that we noticed as well is when we entrench this preserve the status quo, it supports lobbying or unionist behavior. Um, and what that meant is, is that actually it perpetuates the politicking between the different silos uh, in the um, organization. And you even get something like infighting in, in the governance community where people use the governance community for their own purposes. Instead of applying governance, it's about getting back at the other guy. We also noticed that there's re, uh, for, for cases where this is not really working very effectively, where preserve the status quo is the prevailing uh, mantra in the organization, there's also not a holistic perspective. People are not understanding or they don't realize that their behaviors do harm to the wider organization. They are just looking in their silo or in their turf and they don't understand or they don't um, notice the impact they have on in customers or other parts of the organization. We've noticed as well that where there is no clarity of purpose, alignment, or context, we, we do see the prevalence of people holding on to the preserving the status quo. Um, and if there is a lack of clarity, purpose, and alignment, um, you do notice that the people hold on to this uh, current status quo a lot more. The value of governance is unclear to anyone. So people don't really know why these people are doing governance. The, um, the, the value of governance is um, sneered at or people sneer at these governance people or they tr try and play uh, all sorts of shenanigans um, uh, and politicking around with the governance people. Just think back about the last audit you've had. What is it that you think of those audit people uh, in your organization? It's just an open question. There's also some governance uh, capabilities in the organization has got fixed membership. So you end up having the same people doing the same thing because they've been doing it for forever. So other people are there by default they are placed in a governance function because they have a specific job title um, or um, that's that positional membership um, or the, mem the, the governance function does not necessarily uh, have regular activities. So things do slip through the cracks and that's how you get into trouble quite quickly. Another part of the exploration that we did and uh, is around ignorance, uh, ignorance about governance um, and ignorance about the value for change <clears throat> inside an organization. It's either due to lack of skill or people just don't care. It's just another thing I have to do, an obligation I have to do, another ritual I have to sit through to pretend that everything is okay. So the value that... Uh, 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 governance or oversight can bring to an organization is ignored because people don't understand what that is actually, um, that what value it may bring. 
And then one thing that we notice, and every organization over the last number of years stepping that, uh, that I've helped out and that Hori has helped out, we notice this one thing that happens in every organization. And this is that there's too many things on the go at the same time. So you end up with competing priorities and that's probably linked to no clarity of purpose, alignment or context. It's because we don't know really what's important. So we try and do everything. And this just burns people out and it just perpetuates a lot of the conflict. And then suddenly, if you find yourself as, a, as somebody in an oversight function, it just feels like a tsunami of information that you have to crunch and make decisions on. Um, I'm really noticed that it hurts even the people doing the work as well as people in those governance functions by having too much on at the same time. Now, before we all sit down and um, go get into uh, a little bit of a negative space, let's look at how life looks like uh, or how it could be on the other side of that fence. So Horia is going to be discussing about what does it look like? What are the upside of us being able to adjust creating new ways of working from a governance perspective or an oversight perspective mm. and uh, adjust it? And that this is where the adaptive part of adaptive oversight comes in quite strongly. Mm. That's right. So one thing that I would like to say in closing for the challenges is... Um, we're hopeful to inspire much more of an em empathetic connection between communities. So rather than disdain and disrespect and frustration between the oversight community and the initiative, uh, we're hoping to see a lot more of this empathy to say, ah, I understand what these people are dealing with. I understand that we're asking them to do this and this and this. And yeah, that's probably a bit too much. Um, I understand that, yeah, but on the other hand, this is what we're, we're trying to achieve and this is why. And by developing this clarity, uh, this ability to notice what's going on and understand what's the um, general intention from a strategic perspective, we can find a win-win outcome. We can find something inspiring rather than just dealing with resentment, upset, and frustration. So empathy, feeling with people. In other words, the people in the oversight community really cultivating really good emotional intelligence and understanding the emotions, the feelings, the challenges of the people uh, engaged in the work and vice versa, helping the people that are doing the work to see what are the challenges of leadership? What are the challenges of oversight? That's not an easy job at all, particularly when the world has gone mad in, in so many ways around us uh, in recent times. So building this, this mutual empathy is quite a bit of an interesting challenge. Uh, imagine also that from an oversight perspective, we actively teach people and coach them and mentor them to develop a holistic perspective. And we see oversight more as a team activity rather than an individual endeavor. And this is um, frankly something that um, I see the more effective the organization is, the better the teamwork uh, is in the executive community. The more individualistic the executive community, the more fractious the organization becomes because everybody is in it for themselves as opposed to helping each other out. So uh, this is a really fascinating tension um, that the more effective organizations resolve really well by cultivating uh, a sense of um, holistic awareness and holistic contribution. Uh, that um, naturally is well influenced by having really good clarity of value and purpose. In other words, um, what do we um, stand for? Um, what, um, what matters to us? What is the value that we provide in the world around us? So this 
clarity of value. We know what is value. And by value, we don't just mean making money. Because all of this adaptive oversight is perfectly applicable in the social sector just as well. Uh, if you happen to be working in a um, governmental uh, subsidiary or organization or agency, um, clarity of what's the value that we provide to the community, uh, to the public at large, that is also equally necessary. We must have clarity around that. And the more we do, the better we can then align ourselves with that purpose, the more we can attract people that are moved and, and motivated by that, and therefore they can devote their energy and passion into it. Um, we can also shape our rewards and incentives to, to build up, to amplify the impact of the organization. Now, you notice here, we talk about embracing blue work. Uh, this is in reference to the work of David Marquet. He has a book called Leadership as Language, in which he introduces this idea of a red work and blue work. The red work being the work of doing the doing of, of the, uh, the work, keeping the lights um, on, and blue work being the work of reflection, of noticing, of thinking about um, the work. So... If we want to have a really good dynamic balance between preserving the value flow and creating a new way of work that improves upon that value flow, then we must embrace blue work as opposed to simply insisting work, 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 work. Um, this um, brings to mind a situation where um, I was working in an organization and I was describing the importance of um, serious play. And uh, this leader uh, looked at me quite critically and said uh, fairly harshly, but I'm here to work. I'm not here to play. Um, that is a, a really fascinating uh, perspective because that essentially says we're just delivering. It's not our job to make any kind of improvement. It's not our job to be creative in any way. We're just here to work. Because if there's any kind of creativity to be had, if there's any kind of imagination that we need to engage into making things better, we don't know of a better way of achieving that than actual play. Because when we're playing, we're opening ourselves up to the possibility of something a little bit different. And if we're not playing, we're just work, 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 work. Where does this new and novel and different way of doing things come from? How can it possibly emerge if it's not through some form of deliberate uh, invitation of play into our work? Now, that, that is a challenge because that requires us to be a little bit silly, to think a little bit differently. And this is where this inclusion practiced deliberately is absolutely essential because that essentially means I'm inviting challenge to my way of thinking. I'm not satisfied until I ask, so why won't this work? Um, what's wrong with this? How can we kill this, right? And Aldo described in one of the previous sessions, organizations that, uh, that do this deliberately, that only keep things alive because they haven't figured out uh, a, a sensible reason to kill it. It's still viable. It still looks like, yeah, this might actually work quite well. So you keep it going. But this way of cultivating diversity of thought, it's something that um, worryingly, to some extent, uh, our society seems to be um, unlearning. <laughs> to a certain extent, <laughs> right? Um, and what we're suggesting with the adaptive oversight um, thought patterns is we need to cultivate the courage and the discipline to actually challenge ourselves and be comfortable in a little bit of ambiguity, a little bit of openness. We need to cultivate receptivity to other, other ways of thought. And the thing here is it has to do with, we're gonna have a, a, another balance in the 10th episode about safety and courage. It has to be about feeling comfortable 
with uncertainty, feeling comfortable with not knowing and having the intention of discovering things together. So if I think I know something right now, but I reserve a little bit of uncertainty for it to say, I think I know this, but I'm not sure. Maybe there's an even better idea. And I'm inviting a different perspective and on balance, considering all the factors that actually turns out to be a better idea. Me letting go of my previous notions and saying, you know what? My prior perspective wasn't all that right. This is a better idea. Let me embrace this new idea for a while and see how well that fits. Let me change my mind. Let me let go of that idea. That requires us to make a distinction between my identity, my ego, myself, and the idea itself. Right. We've done that for a customer um, that uh, initially was just in Asia Pacific uh, operations, um, and that it was amazing to work with a, a leader in the organization that had exactly that perspective. Um, I think one of the episodes going forward, we may uh, interview interview him. Yeah. Um, but this is what Horia just explained. Um, he's actually gone out and put his neck out there in the organization in Asia Pacific. He was the, the hippo in the room, and he actually brought himself down to the level of everybody else. And he, he showed all of those things that Horia has just explained. And it was amazing to see the turnaround in the organization. We're, we're, we're really proud. We want to name the name, but we can't yet. Um, but it is, it's been a wonderful journey. Um, mm -hmm. observing that um, that spirit and how what it's done for everybody in the organization sorry Ori, i just no worries no worries yeah um in case people aren't familiar with the expression uh, being the hippo um that uh, is an acronym from the highest paid person's opinion <laughs> that's where that comes from right and the challenge with uh, hippo behavior is it anchors uh, the conversation. If uh, the high, highest paid person says something, everybody, because of the power gradient, goes, oh, well, if the big boss said so, well, then we might need to fall into line. As opposed to, as we were discussing here, practicing inclusion and therefore being mindful of this potential power gradient. And as a result, in terms of behavior, we're going to cover this later on in terms of the, the skills frame, um, speaking last. Uh, the more influence, the more power your position affords you, the more gentle you should be with it, the more you should be mindful of the bias that that creates for people and therefore keep quiet. Now, um, the, the last aspect of the desired outcomes is this cultivating of a Kaizen spirit. Uh, Kaizen is continuous improvement. So how do we inspire people to see that um, practicing calculated risk-taking, um, embracing discipline to, to set us free? How do we have clarity on uh, balancing uh, teaching and learning with actual doing? All of these are really useful things to, uh, to nurture as an oversight community in your organization. In other words, you're actively balancing the do good stuff with do improvements to the way of work as well. So you embrace this Kaizen spirit and you make sure that it's manifested by everybody in the organization. So what are we um, risking when overcorrecting, when changing things too much, Aldo? Thank you, Horia. So one of the first things um, is uh, when we get too much uh, focus on, on, on creating new ways of working is people take their eyes off the ball with the risks that's inherent when you introduce change to an organization. Now, Al Shalloway, um, we work with him quite regularly. Um, he, he started asking questions a few weeks ago and asking, if you're adopting an agile framework, what are you doing to manage the risks? Because he noticed as well that very few organizations actually do a proper risk assessment with just uh, adopting agile framework, but it's a lot 
deeper than just the agile framework. When you introduce change into an organization or new ways of working, you introduce risk. And those risks are not always managed. Oh, it's this, we're bringing agile because the competition is doing it and you don't really understand the risk you're introducing into the organization. You will notice things um, that change risks associate uh, things associated with change risk is you'll start to see people are being burned out. You will see shock by the change. You will see people's behavior in it. You also see some dogmatism, change for the sake of change. Um, that type of thinking you'll start to notice as well. Um, there's an in imbalance between convergence and invergence. So when uh, in uh, divergence and convergence, sorry. <laughs> so what we mean by that is, is that you need to um, let some ideas, you need to explore enough before you make a decision to bring things together and pick something. So sometimes it's you just have a um, uh, uh, unbalanced exploration and people are trying things all over the place and the whole system that you're working gets destabilized or it's too much convergent as we only look at two choices instead or options for a specific situation instead of three or four per perhaps and that causes quite a lot of uh, frustration and constraint in which people try and do new ways of uh, invent new ways of working. We also notice that, uh, and this has happened to me personally, this is a little bit of a war story, is I worked with an organization in Johannesburg um, a few years ago and um, I tried to take the team through continuous improvement and through new ways of working and exploring new ways of working and picking a new way of working. And then when I left, they didn't practice it. And that was a hard lesson for me because I learned that I owned the change and the team didn't take emotional ownership of that change. So that also happens uh, when you don't have... Um, uh, uh, when you overcorrect on choosing your ways of working. The next thing um, that comes to that, that we've uh, found with the research is that uh, some of the changes or the new ways of working that we pick is um, ignorant of the context. So it ignores the context in which you want to bring in. So sometimes you might want to bring in a I don't know, a daily stand-up, but you don't have a place where you can actually do that. How do you adjust for that? So that's a simple example. One of the teams I coached here in New Zealand, they complained that they didn't have space among their desks that they could have the stand-up. Everybody was complaining that they were too loud and they tried to have it in the kitchen and people kept walking through the stand-up session to get to the milk in the fridge when they were trying to make coffee. And also they were told they were too loud in the kitchen as well. So the context for adopting a specific type of practice wasn't necessarily correct. It's a silly example, but there's a lot of other examples of just picking a way of working without understanding how it could potentially work in your context. Now, if you want to do it as an experiment, that's okay, but just dogmatically keeping going and not adjusting it to suit your context, that's just dangerous. Then there is uh, this phenomenon of un unconscious incompetence, and this is uh, also related to what we, what we sometimes refer to as the peak of Mount Stupid, and this is the uh, curve about how we build skills. Um, it's the uh, Horia, just help me out here. What's the it's the um, Dunning Kruger effect? That Dunning Kruger effect, and this is where you think you know uh, a little bit about where you think where you've heard about something, you think you know about that specific practice or method, and then acting as the world authority on it. And there's a lot of inherent problems that comes with that. Um, and that is ignoring, I think it's really rooted in 
if there are certain practices or methods or rituals that you've heard other organizations have been using, instead of just blindly copying it, copying it is not understanding what the intent behind that specific practice or ritual is. And that is a form of unconscious incompetence. Um, so have a look out for those types of things. There are other things that we couldn't really categorize. Um, and this comes back to uh, if you have a consultancy, um, when they bring in new ways of working, whose interests are they serving? Um, I may rattle a few cages with that question. Also notice uh, as well, um, if look at the interventions of oversight uh, function itself, people may fear it, they may fight it, um, and look, look at that uh, in your context. Um, then uh, there's a, a, a note, a note there is about organizations as a petri dish for external influences. So again, watch out for those types of things, people introducing change and not taking the risk on themselves if they want to bring about change in an external organization. Now, let's have a look again, Horia. You, you, you get to play the good cop today. Um, <laughs> let's have a look a little bit about what type of benefits do we retain from preserving the status quo? Mm -hmm. Well, um... First and foremost, I would start with safety. Um, despite the fact that it's in the lower right corner, um, we crave certainty. We want to know for sure, right? What's going to happen? Because the world is fierce. The, worst, the world is harsh. The world is out to, to get us. So the safer we are, the more comfortable we are. We want to know that um, we can thrive, we can flourish from day to day, we can get better over time. So safety is really essential. Um, so keeping things going well, uh, if we're in a commercial endeavor, then uh, that means we're making a good profit, uh, we're thriving, we're doing well. Um, we, uh, we want to practice not perfectionism, but what we call good enoughism. Yeah? Because there's no such thing as perfect. Uh, and um, the more we um, agonize over making things perfect, the more we run the risk of not noticing the beauty and the marvel of the world as it is. So uh, learning how to accept good enough and how to uh, be satisfied. And this is where some aspects of simplicity and minimalism come into place. Um, that could be um, really, really beneficial. Um, having a good sense of, uh, on the one hand, we call it stability of teams, but it's a bit more than just having a stable team that works together for a long period of time. It's more having the comfort in teaming well, having the sense of, I can really rely on my teammates and do so uh, with genuine trust and relishing the connection that I have with people. That's what we mean by team stability. Um, building on our strengths, on our capabilities, um, doing so through um, taking advantage of our, of our great skill and uh, craftsmanship and so on. Um, having really good focus, knowing this is our niche in the industry or the market, and this is where we play, and we do this really, really well. People um, seek us out. Because hey, we're the, the quality offering. Uh, we're we're focused well, or simply having reliable delivery, uh, being productive, being a, a well-oiled machine, deliver, deliver, deliver. Um, very nice, very satisfying, very effective. The challenge with that is, if we do it um, too much, and the people, their personalities are. Uh, prone to boredom, then they might go, ah, been there, done that. So what else is there, right? So um, having this uh, ability to, to deliver well is also something that needs to be cultivated in terms of how do we nurture the right kind of community to look after effective delivery uh, in the long run. So um, 
balancing teams well. It's really, really interesting. So um, getting such uh, benefits uh, might be the province of what do we look for? What's the overall purpose, Aldo? And this is uh, when we have balance and what both of these camps or what both of these polarities are striving towards is the ability to have adaptive oversight. And the pun is intended because that means that the oversight function is adaptive. It is able to balance the overseeing of people, money, information, products, customers, all of the variables, and they're able to balance that in a meaningful way, and it's visible. Everybody understands what, is, what the oversight function uh, bring in terms of value, and it, you will notice that the value, the value of oversight is clear to everybody. Um, you, you'll, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of practices of good corporate citizenship, and you'll see that there's healthy product life cycles, um, and you even retire products when it's supposed to be retired, and you don't cling on onto things like that. So these are all um, what we get the benefits of both. Having good adaptive oversight is also quite beneficial to developing delivery fluency. Um, and this has got quite a lot of aspects to it. You right size the work and things like, uh, silly things like um, the, um, uh, what you are capable of delivering is really well matched with what is expected of you to deliver. So you're not overloaded. You can keep, to, uh, sus you can keep change, sustaining change in your organization going, you, you notice that there's a sense of flow in the organization. Um, it is, there's quite a lot of things that helps uh, th that you can notice. Um, the benefits of both does give you delivery fluency. You also notice quite a lot of elements of healthy culture. Um, inside the organization, there's a strong sense of learning uh, so part of the continuous learning and the healthy culture, there's a very strong link there between the two. Um, and you'll notice that there's little things like no dependency on heroes. Um, Horia spoke about psychological safety uh, as well, that, that maybe um, um, that, that it having a balance between the two um, perpetuates uh, psychological safety. The other thing there that's called MindFlex, um, and that means that the oversight function does not impose immovable constraints. Is they're always open to understand what the reality of things are and then adjusting. And it's linked to this ambidexterity that um, uh, we notice in some organizations, they know when to explore and they know when to exploit. And they've got clear guidance. They've got clear uh, gut, a gut feel about when it is to explore and when it is to exploit. What is it that they both of these camps or both of these uh, polarities fear the most, Aurea? Well, um, first and foremost, um, humans are psychologically biased towards loss. We're all afraid of losing stuff. We're much more afraid of losing than we are afraid of, well, than we anticipate gaining something. So loss of control, loss of power, loss of status, um, loss of liberty, uh, loss of economic um, stability and safety. All of these are elements of what are we standing to lose if we lose the plot in delivering well. If we fail to deliver well, what's going to happen? Well, our reputation is going to suffer. We're going to get fired. We're going to get um, potentially even sent to jail if we do silly things in a desperate attempt to keep things going. Um, there's also this uh, difficulty with, yeah, but what if stuff happens that we don't even know that we don't know? 
and we have these unknown unknowns. Ah, so scary. Yeah. Um, that's the freeze reaction. That's right. Well, the four Fs uh, yeah. basically are the, uh, the the key human reactions. Um, realizing uh, risks, right? The risk being realized essentially means there's a risk of this and a risk of that, but then the risks actually manifest and the risks become issues. And the issues may become showstoppers in uh, certain instances. Um, sometimes people focus on um, harvesting as much money as they can from their current business model, forgetting that the business changes altogether. It's a classic with Kodak. Uh, they've been um, an iconic um, company, an iconic brand that has contributed Im immensely to the world of photography. And despite the fact that Kodak actually um, invented the digital camera, they were the first to come up with um, a proven prototype. Um, of, a, of a digital camera, the executives simply um, sidetracked the digital camera and um, attempted to continue to make lots and lots of money out of making lots and lots of film and uh, chemicals and uh, paper and so on for photography that includes all sorts of printed stuff. If you think about it, in the last decade, how often do you actually print some photos down as opposed to simply having them in some form of digital format very very rarely considerably uh rarer than 20 30 or 40 years ago yeah so technology has changed enormously so um what skills might we use to balance to achieve better ambidexterity Oh, there's lots of things, and we may have mentioned some of them uh, as well before uh, in, in some of the previous ex, uh, episodes. Um, so when it comes to actions and skills, um, look at what you can develop around value management. Okay, Build some really strong value models or definitions of value. Look at um, having an hand on court. Give people the freedom to actually stop the production line if they notice something is wrong. Do chartering, and this is something that we've been really doing quite with, with quite a lot of organizations over the last three years, and we noticed that chartering gives us an immense difference in the way that uh, projects um, and product success uh, plays out. We, we have had customers that tell us, uh, oh, we're too busy, we don't do chartering, um, but they have time to do the project over. They don't have time to do chartering, but they have, to, they have time to do it over. I don't get it. One of the other things um, to look at uh, as well in terms of skills uh, and capabilities to, to cultivate is focus on those little practices that builds quality in from the onset. What is it that you can do to build quality in from the start? before you even produce any product or any service, how do you build quality in? And there's a few ideas about having at least the definitions of ready and done. That's one, that's two ways of actually getting it in there. Try some A-B testing uh, in order to build quality in from the beginning as well as to the end. There are a few other quality practices that I notice that's missing here, Horio. And uh, we will probably get into that um, at some stage. Then invest in deeper oversight capabilities. This is the focus. It is about adaptive oversight. Of course, we have to say focus on oversight capabilities, but help the, the oversight community to understand the intent behind new, new methods, new ways of working. Encourage them to learn. Um, refer to bodies of knowledge that's out there. And I know that uh, Discipline Agile is, is listed here, but go and explore those ideas with the oversight community. Discuss it, talk through what could work, what could not work and why. Understand why it can't work. Um, be clear about what is expected of the oversight capability in your organization. 
Be clear about the value that they bring to your organization. Um, the next thing is, is that all of this requires really good leadership. Um, and one of the things that David Mokai, you notice that we love the work that he's done. Uh, he mentioned in his first book about turn the ship around is he says, don't breathe, but certify. So make sure that your oversight capability is not about getting a briefing from the project managers or whoever reports into the oversight capability. It's certified. It's not about briefing. It's about certifying. Invest in learning and training. I've mentioned that before for the oversight, but also for people in leadership or potential leadership uh, positions. Another thing that we've know that uh, from the playbook of turn the ship around is learn with the auditors. Is to actually invite the auditors as early as you can and ask them what is it that you'll be looking out for when you come and audit us or when you come and have a look. Uh, a, pay a little bit more scrutiny or attention to this bit or that bit of the project or of the organization. The sooner you can bring them in, the sooner you can actually go and learn how to adapt your oversight capability. And by taking that stance, the auditors are a lot more prone to try and help you make things better than to actually become an um, adversary to your organization. Invest in team building. Build the capability of teamwork. So Horia um, has uh, uh, identified in earlier in, to the, in this specific talk about the value of teamwork, um, but there's quite a lot of practices, methods, uh, and techniques and rituals that you can bring into your oversight com community to actually let them behave like a team instead of it perpetuating silos. Really try and create an oversight uh, community team instead of it just being a function that somebody doesn't really want to fulfill. Be clear about their values what is the social responsibility they bring into the organization and into the wider community as well? And there's a let the wookie in, um, bring the auditor in as part of a team member of the oversight team. That's a nice example. Aurea, what are the warning signs we need to look at when, right. when we're in this, when we have balance and then things start to slip? Yeah, this is a good fun. So we spoke about the hippo uh, and the challenges there when conflict navigation is ineffective, when bullying happens, when uh, there's no clear way of escalation, when uh, we have the sense of um, overburdening uh, or overbearing um, attitude uh, towards um, initiatives. Um, that's, that's a sign that mm, something's not quite right. The challenge there is having the agents to actually notice this and take action on it. So uh, a, a key factor here is to develop connections with people you can trust to serve as your court jesters, as the um, people that will reflect with candor what's happening and what's needed for the um, improvement of the organization. Um, beyond optics and appearances. Now, unproductive language and communication, uh, blame language aggression, sarcasm, um, uh, noticing um, too much um, gossip and bad mouthing and, and, and so on. There's nothing wrong with uh, a gossip of appreciation where, did you hear what awesome thing they, they've done over there? Oh, those guys are amazing. Well, usually that happens quite rarely. Most of the time we like to complain. And it's like, ah, oh, those guys, they're good for nothing. Ah, oh, they have done it in for us. Yeah, no good. Um, <clears throat> when we see people censoring themselves and you, you notice this in body language and sometimes they might even come to you and tell you, well, Whew, I'm glad you said that. I, I didn't have the courage to, to say it, right? People have a fear of, of telling things as they are. 
um, or there's no um, continuous improvement awareness. Nobody pays any attention whatsoever to any kind of improvement. Or um, you show up um, in a retrospective, well, a session that's called a retrospective, but it's not a retrospective. It doesn't behave like a retrospective. It's just a gripe session. People blame this and blame that, complain about this and complain about that. It's like, oh, look at the time. Let's be off. It's like, Phew, that ain't a retrospective. That's, that's no good. If that happens, then this balance of oversight to um, to initiative and, and de doing things better is no good. If people are too secretive, is that oh, no, you're not allowed to do to, to know that. No, it's like need to know. It's like no. Very few organizations, if any, uh, benefit tremendously from keeping secrets. Uh, we live in a, on a single planet. We're one humanity. Being ridiculously secretive with one another. It's not all that helpful. And particularly if you're within an organization that is intending to achieve great things together, the more we see how we can help one another, the more we understand what's going on with one another, the more effective we can be at helping each other out and achieving great things. So when you see too much secrecy, you know, mm, something's not quite right. Sure, there will be some aspects of, uh, of life that will require some elements of secrecy, but by and large, no. Um, in terms of making ways of work effective, you need uh, good transparency. And then finally, there's lots of other, we call them smells of the culture. Um, Alex Bell of the Boeing Company wrote a couple of really uh, ridiculously amusing and very insightful papers about um, the the challenges of modeling with the unified modeling language. And uh, he talked about uh, the UML fevers. Um, he's essentially identified a, a range of illnesses, if you will. And uh, if you read between the lines, you notice that the same patterns, the same fevers apply to pretty much any um, framework, any approach, any particularly um, favorite way of approaching uh, work. So the, the UML fevers are a classic, right, in terms of noticing, categorizing, and um, being aware of, of what's actually going on. And it's the same thing with um, noticing other um, habits um, of, oh, the coach will, uh, will, will tell us what we're supposed to do now. If that's what you're uh, you're encountering something's not right. Uh, there's the the we they boundary. There's the we and they. Uh, the more we think in terms of they, uh, talking about people within our organization, that's not all that helpful. Um, blame avoidance, um, blames personship, uh, learn helplessness, uh, a sense of uh, of anxiety and, and frustration. Um, um, sometimes people uh, literally just uh, getting burnt out and exiting the organization. All of these are signs that something's not right. Yeah? And when we're noticing things like that, hey, then we better figure out what actions to take as Aldo has described. So uh, this wraps up the part one of the explore and innovate balanced with maintain competent capability. So next, next episode, we'll be taking on the, the, the next portion of that, and that is looking from the grassroots level up from the initiative, uh, people practicing in the initiative. Um, and we'll be um, looking at how things look from their perspective. Um, if you, again, the, the office stands, if you are a uh, oversight practitioner, and you have noticed things that you that we may have missed, or we have um, identified things here that triggered a, a bunch of stories that you can come tell us. Um, you're more than welcome to contact us, and we'd be happy to get you uh, onto the Focus podcast and have a little bit of a chat around your experiences as an oversight practitioner. We'll see you next time. I'm Aldo Roll. And I'm Horia Slushansky. See you soon. <laughs>